Advocacy organizations play an important role in improving our system, from identifying and highlighting problems to initiating reforms to being a watchdog for implementation. Today, with a keen appetite for criminal justice reform, advocacy organizations have fresh energy. There seems to be a new understanding in, 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 in the country, and it's hopefully starting to kick in in a big way. Our panel of leading experts will shed light on the landscape and progress of criminal justice reform and the process needed to achieve and implement further advances. Moderating this panel is Michael Troncoso, Director of Criminal Justice at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Michael is a dedicated proponent of comprehensive reform and a dynamic leader at the forefront of a movement to transform the criminal justice system. We are so grateful, Michael, that you're here with us today. Thank you for that uh, gentle and completely undeserved encomium. I'm very grateful for it. Um, Thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Um, I want to introduce our distinguished panel very briefly. Their august and extraordinarily impressive bios are in the materials available uh, to you right now, so I won't uh, belabor the point too much, but I want to introduce uh, three pretty incredible leaders in advocacy and criminal justice reform around um, the country. Um, I want to introduce Mark Levin, uh, a, an extraordinary leader um, out of Texas who is leading and probably one of the most significant uh, thought partners um, uh, in both the center and political right of center around the country in criminal justice reform, and we are very lucky to have him. Briefly, Udi Offer, uh, who is leading the Smart Justice Campaign over at the ACLU and maybe knows more about state-based advocacy and criminal justice reform than anyone I've had the privilege of working with as an extraordinary leader in this space, and Kara Gotch from The Sentencing Project, who is, um, I rely on your data pretty much every single day, and I think I've told you. If you go to The Sentencing Project's website, they have this extraordinarily um, rich, data-driven analysis of the problem of mass incarceration all around the country. I encourage you to visit it. I steal shamelessly from their website all the time little factoids and nuggets to make myself seem smart, which I fail at. All right. Um, I'm going to try to inject a little humor and energy into this presentation, um, although I do see that we have a number of judges in the room, and I am tempted as a former prosecutor to introduce myself, Michael Trunko, for the people and make my presentation, um, but I will resist that uh, urge. Here, we're here to talk about the role of advocacy. How many people in the room are advocates? Uh, um, show of hands. Don't be shy, you're advocates. Come on, hands high, please. That's pretty good. Um, how many in law enforcement or the judiciary? Show of hands. Oh my. All right, I really should have said Michael Troncosa for the people, uh, as you're, with your honor's permission. Um, advocates are, are writing laws all across this country. Criminal justice reform, pretty much open up the New York Times, open up your local paper, open up Netflix, you're gonna see this. It is no longer a niche issue that concerns a small swath of society. This is an important and morally urgent social issue that concerns a broad swath of Americans. We're seeing momentum all across the country. First Step Act uh, recently passed, uh, and um, a lot of folks in this room had something to do with that, which is a big victory. Um, all across the states, whether you're in Oklahoma, you're in Arizona, Tennessee, California, criminal justice bills are working their way through state legislatures into the desks of governors. So in this extraordinary moment, are we winning? Are incarceration rates really going down? Is the system becoming fairer or smaller or more transparent? Or is all of this energy around advocacy, is it really just sort of in the process of becoming? Mark, what do you think? Well, I think we're making some headway. I, I really do. Um, obviously, the numbers show a slight decline in incarceration in the United States over the last several years. That was preceded, of course, by a five-fold increase from the mid-70s to the mid-2000s. Um, so it's, uh, it is a uh, difficult process, but I think that certainly when crime is going down and incarceration is going down, no one can say that's not a success. Um, but I also think we're becoming increasingly aware that we have to measure our results by positive outcomes, uh, people who are employed, people who are able to take care of their families. Um, and of course, also looking at the full uh, spectrum of correctional control. And so we're increasingly looking at uh, 
the fact that we have too many people on probation and parole for too long and that too often these systems are tripwires rather than truly alternatives to incarceration because in fact uh, half the people going into prisons across the country are people revoked from probation or parole, many of those for technical violations. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work left to do. I think the other thing that we have to remember is that we heard from some really uh, terrific reform-minded and I, I prefer reform-minded to progressive uh, prosecutors earlier today. Um, but these are all in urban areas. And we did a paper on rural pretrial incarceration. The Vera Institute has done seminal work on it. But incarceration has been going up, both in local jails and in commitments to state prison from rural areas. And so that's offset some of the uh, really sharp reductions in urban areas and uh, more modest reductions in suburban areas. So I think we have to uh, make sure this movement spans the entire country, uh, not just the big cities. If our goal is criminal justice reform, I think you could argue that we are winning. If our goal is to end mass incarceration, then I don't think we are winning. Um, and I differentiate between the two. Um, I think by all measurements, we are still in the deep, in a deep crisis of mass incarceration. Uh, you know, I think we went from having 25% um, um, of the world's population to maybe around 22% of the world's population, even though, of a prison population, even though we only have about 5% of the world's population. So we're inching our way down, but racial disparities continue to be extreme. Um, we are not seeing the type of transformational change that we need in the United States in order to end mass incarceration. And I say that as someone who takes pride in the fact that the ACLU, um, where I direct our campaign for smart justice, justice, which is our campaign to end mass incarceration, we, su we successfully um, help lead to the passage of 122 uh, state reform laws last year. 122 laws passed in the states last year to reform the criminal justice, the criminal legal system. That's in addition to the First Step Act, right, which got, I think, the most prominent press. So states are working. They're passing legislation. Advocates are winning. But yet, um, we are still so far behind this goal of ending mass incarceration. And I'll just point to one thing that I think differentiates the different ways to think about this. Um, Judge Gertner earlier did a presentation which I thought was amazing, and I'm a huge fan, but there was one thing I disagreed with her on, and that she started off her presentation by saying, the conversation shouldn't be about less incarceration or more incarceration, right? Those aren't policy choices. And I disagree with that. I think. At the ACLU, we have a 50% decarceration goal. That is a goal that we set. Um, and I am very comfortable with setting that goal. Um, um, and then, you know, seeing what are the types of policies and practices that are needed in order to achieve that goal. Because unless we have that decarceration goal, we're just kind of gonna constantly tinker at the edges and not get the type of transformational change that we need. Which is why, for example, of all the things that happened in 2018, one of the ones I was most excited about was, I don't know if John Crusoe is still here, the newly elected uh, district, attorney, uh, district attorney in Dallas, he ran on a platform that included committing to a 15 to 20 percent decarceration goal by the end of his first term. And I actually don't know of any other successful DA candidate who ever ran on that type of platform. And now we're seeing him implement the type of changes that will reach towards that goal. So I'm, again, criminal justice reform, yes, and mass incarceration, we still have such a long way to go. Thanks. Uh, the sensing project, you know, obviously is very much in support of reducing mass incarceration, limiting mass incarceration. My colleague, Nazgul Ganush, put out a report last year that some of you might be familiar with that at current trends, uh, if we seek to reduce uh, levels of incarceration by 50%, it would take about 75 years. I've actually been doing criminal justice reform for 22 years. I don't want to wait another 75 years. It's really a very long period of time. Uh, you know, at the Sensing Project, we're also really trying to influence, sort of push the conversation around what criminal justice reform means and what uh, mass incarceration, addressing mass incarceration will really take. And I was so glad that earlier today we were, people were talking about violent offenses and reckoning with that. Uh, we have launched a campaign uh, to end life imprisonment. I would encourage you all to go to our website, endlifeimprisonment.org. Um, that is a huge, as incarceration has gone down, the number of people serving life has gone up. 
despite the fact that crime rates, violent crime rates in particular, continue to have declined significantly over the last 25 years and remain at uh, historic lows. And it's an area that we really need to spend more time with, be thinking about how we are going to confront these long, long excessive sentences, whether a life or a virtual life, 50 years or more, or long sentences, uh, because violent crime is who, the vi people who commit violent offenses, those are who are the majority of who are incarcerated in the state system. And it's something we really, as a reform community, need to take seriously. So if we're talking about transformational change in the criminal legal system slash criminal justice system, mass incarceration versus reform, these are, these are big themes. Kara has just proposed, I mean, we really should be focusing on very, very long sentences, extreme sentencing. Um, are we seeing wins anywhere in that spectrum of more transformational changes that are dealing with folks that uh, have been committed on offenses that may be more serious and they have very long sentences? Or are we seeing wins on, in different areas of the spectrum in, in some of the advocacy work that you're each doing? And maybe we can start with Udi. You're working in all 50 states. What are you seeing? Well, obviously one of the uh, positive uh, components of the First Step Act was starting to take um, to change some of the long sentences by changing, you know, the third strike law from a mandatory life sentence to a 25 year sentence. That doesn't feel incredibly exciting, but at least it's starting to chip away at that. On the state level, we're just starting to see that advocacy. I'm very excited about Connecticut. I think Connecticut, right, when you think about the, the volume of incarceration in the United States, Connecticut is not gonna change, you know, the volume, right? If, you, if every person incarcerated in Connecticut is released, you still have a huge mass incarceration problem in the United States. But I see the roles of states like Connecticut is, uh, is to begin kind of the transformational changes to show what's possible. And I know the governor's office there and advocates there are really beginning to think about how to take on serious offenses, you know, like armed robbery um, and changing the way that the system responds to these types of offenses that doesn't necessarily involve incarceration. But beyond that, actually, I actually have not seen the type of stuff that we need. The places that give me the most hope are outside of the United States, right? I recently visited um, prisons in Germany and Norway, um, and over there, you know, the way that they respond to offenses involving violence are completely different, right? They first look at what are the needs of the individual, um, and then they, they cater the whole sentencing to the needs of that individual, whether he or she has an underlying mental health problem, drug addiction problem, they don't, they don't put people on tracks based on offenses, they put people on tracks based on needs. And that's the type of transformational change that we need. So, you know, I was talking, I think, to Larry Krasner earlier today where we, you know, he had also visited this prison in Berlin, which are open prisons. Have you guys ever heard of this concept of open prisons where people go to work during the day, they may go see family on the weekends, but they sleep in the prison at night. And I visited one of these prisons and People who were in there were in for things like homicide, right, sex offenses, you know, kind of the third rail of anything in the, in, in, when it comes to reforms in the United States. But they were eligible for these prisons because there was a determination made that they will be committed to the program, they're unlikely to recidivate, and therefore are ready for this. And recidivism rates in both Germany and Norway are, you know, one-tenth of the recidivism rates in the United States. So by all measures, um, these alternatives are succeeding, but we have not seen that in the United States, with the exceptions of you know, programs like Common Justice in Brooklyn, and in San Francisco there's a great program, but we, we're not seeing anywhere close to what we need to. So as, on the deep end of the system, there also is what's happened for people who've committed offenses is youth, right? Obviously, the Supreme Court has had some major decisions around juvenile life without parole, and that really has opened the door, I think, to other discussions um, where people are now, for example, in California, creating a, a system where youth who are considered up until their 20s have created a special parole hearing process. So youth uh, serving long sentences now Bef their parole hearing, a specialized hearing court, uh, hearing commission can take into consideration um, their age and their uh, brain development in determining whether it's appropriate for someone to be released or not. That's also happening in the District of Columbia where they've passed a law and they want to uh, expand it to people under 25, up to the age of just 24, 
uh, yeah, 24. So, and these are people who've committed violent offenses, serious crimes, who would be, have sent, eligible for sentence reduction. You know, for a number of years, the American Law Institute is talking about a uh, second look, which would allow uh, for either judges or a governing body to consider review sentences after a certain set period of time. I think we're gonna be hearing more about that. That's been happening generally in the juvenile setting, but I think we're gonna be starting to hear more about that um, for adults, and I'm really encouraged by that. Yeah, no, I think the um, focusing on special populations uh, in places where obviously um, actually overall reducing sentences by statute for certain violent offenses. And of course, you know, violent offenses is a huge spectrum. You have barroom fights, uh, you have simple assaults, there's there's such a, a wide range, but and many circumstances that may not quite meet a self-defense threshold, but where there were many mitigating circumstances. But some of the special populations, in addition to emerging adults, which we heard about, juveniles. By the way, juvenile incarceration is down 60% in this country, which is a pretty significant fact. So extending that to the 18 to early 20s, uh, is a great approach. People with severe mental illness, uh, veterans courts, a lot of uh, veterans courts take people with violent offenses. You mentioned here um, prosecutors in Brooklyn and Manhattan sending folks to Common Justice, which has a great record of success. Uh, there's also the Arches program in New York City, uh, which is a two-thirds reduction recidivism. They use formerly incarcerated people as mentors for uh, some young folks who committed uh, robberies and so forth. So um, there's, there's some really good examples, but a lot of it probably needs to come through discretion uh, placement, like is what occurs through the prosecutor saying, uh, I'm going to refer this case to common justice, rather than necessarily having the political will to, you know, across the board do change the statutes regarding some of these offenses. I, I, I'm struck by, and, and thank you guys for, for these, these rich comments, but I'm struck by the delta between, here we are talking about Germany, and open prisons, and you're committed. You know, you co you're you're committed on a homicide sentence. You're leaving and going to work, coming coming back to your, um, you know, to to your confinement. Uh, armed robbery, common justice. Um, we're talking about some pretty bold ideas. Um, how far off is that for us? And what are the political conditions that you think are really necessary for us to do things like that in? if that really is the proper goal, to do things like that in some of our highest incarcerating states. Let me tell you, in, in Arizona, I was very, very happy to see that recently Arizona, I, I think they're, uh, they passed a statute um, that says to get the habitual offender um, enhancement, you can't have both the prior offense and the enhancing offense on the same accusatory pleading. That was groundbreaking. I mean, it was like huge, right? Very, very, very big deal in Arizona. We're a long way on the open open prisons if you commit a homicide offense. So is, if that's the place to get, what are the politics that we're going to need to unlock to start to build consensus towards, as Udi said, ending mass incarceration? Udi, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so this is where this is where I could be a bit optimistic. First of all, I'm, I'm excited for Arizona. I think next year, potentially, there could be a major ballot initiative around truth and sentencing. So I think that's, you know, I'm hopeful for Arizona, and I think it will see some big changes over the next year. And pretty much all of our groups are involved in Arizona in one way or another. But um, here are the good news for, because I think it all boils down to politicians. And we need more bold politicians who are willing to talk about this issue in the type of way that will lay the groundwork for transformational change. So here's the good news. The last poll that we did at the ACLU um, right before the 2018 midterms actually showed me that we need to do a better job educating elected officials and candidates for office that it is safe for them to run on the type of platforms that like a Larry Krasner ran on and John Crusoe and Rachel Rollins. So in our last poll, it showed that first of all, 78% of likely voters were more likely to vote for a candidate who ran on a criminal justice reform platform. And that included 72% of Republicans. Then the response I always get from my Republican allies, they say, yeah, yeah, but don't talk about racial disparities because that's not popular. I disagree with that, and our polling also tells us we should disagree with that. That same poll showed that 75% of likely voters, including 67% of white Republicans, right, who everyone is scared of, right, the white Republicans, 67% um, of white Republicans were more likely to vote for a candidate who pledges to reduce and speak out against racial disparities. 
I don't know what to tell you. Like, you know, it is, it is a popular issue. And the younger the voter, the more popular it is. You know, for voters under the age of 44, criminal justice reform is a top issue. Yet when I see these polls that come out where, you know, uh, Americans are asked to rank what are the most important issues, most of the time criminal justice reform is not even a choice. So there's still such a divide between kind of the professional class of pollsters, professional class of candidates, and what voters actually want. And for me, that gives me hope. I will end just by saying, the ACLU right now has this campaign where we're trying to engage with the presidential candidates where we have uh, volunteers with video cameras going out to the early primary states asking candidates to commit to a 50% decarceration goal by the end of their first term. So we're asking presidential candidates to commit to reducing the federal prison population by 50% by the end of their first term. When we first launched this, people said no one will ever commit. We've already had three candidates on video commit to this goal. And that is Booker, Gabbard, and Buttigieg. Um, um, the one candidate who said that's not rational to commit to this goal is, is Biden. Um, um, but, but it shows, this is, this is the kind of stuff, we need to change the political landscape where these candidates will not be held accountable for these goals, and that's when we'll start seeing the transformational changes in the legislature. Yeah. That it, extraordinary exegesis on politically where we are. Mark, is that the problem? We're not talking enough about race. Well, you know, I, I, I think that we have to talk about it. I mean, it's kind of an elephant in the room. Um, I think that, uh, but the way we talk about it's important. And I mean, the reality is, look, I mean, Senator Tim Scott, who's a conservative Republican, talks about all the times he was pulled over uh, for no reason. Um, and, you know, the, um, the reality is people, we know that obviously all races use drugs in the same amounts, but there's many diff much a great difference in terms of arrest and prosecution uh, rates. Um, but it doesn't mean we're necessarily saying, Look, all, most judges and prosecutors are racist. You know, that's two different things, right? But we certainly want to, when we're doing something like risk assessment, which we support, uh, we say, let's not look at drug possession, right, uh, in, in this calculating somebody's risk score, because we know that's heavily uh, influenced by where somebody lives, whether they were arrested or not for drugs in the past. So there's things we can do once people come into the criminal justice system to try to account for um, these uh, disparities. Um, I think as far as the uh, political support. Um, you might remember a few years ago, Governor Nathan Deal campaigned for re-election. He sent out a mail piece saying, black incarceration is down 20% under my uh, gubernatorial leadership. And then, thankfully, unlike some mail pieces, it was actually true. Um, so this used to be a third rail that politicians thought they couldn't touch. But now, increasingly, I think they are realizing this is actually something um, that can uh, be a nor to my benefit to campaign on uh, criminal justice reform. Um, and I think, you know, we emphasize, look, if you're about limiting government, why would you exempt the prison system from that? Um, and some of the issues that are really helpful with conservatives to get the conversation started, so I think jo uh, John Crusoe mentioned earlier, civil asset forfeiture reform, right? Because that's taking uh, somebody's property without a conviction. Um, but even on something like mandatory minimums, when you think about it, you're taking power away from judges and juries and giving it to politicians. And, and case of federal mandatory minimums to give it to Congress, which has no um, uh, de details, no information about the particular case. How is that a conservative thing to do to impose a one-size-fits-all solution? Um, and then obviously keeping families together, the whole, all the involvement of faith. We work closely with prison fellowship, the whole notion of redemption. So there's so much in here that appeals to people on all sides of the spectrum. Kara, um, I'd like to pose two questions to you following up on, on both what, what Udi and, and Mark said. One, is racial justice the winning message, or is it the goal? And is there a difference between those two things? And number two, in your work around the country as one of the, the country's leaders on this, who are the bold politicians? And might I suggest is, are some of the, the reform-minded prosecutors that we've been speaking with today and their colleagues, are they among that group that you think are important to winning reform? I think racial justice is our goal. I think we have to make it front and center in the conversation about reform. We know that prison causes harm. Our legal criminal justice system causes harm to people and families, and it's disproportionately a burden that communities 
of color are facing. They are families who are affected for a lifetime and for generations. Their political power is compromised because of felony disenfranchisement laws. Their ability to earn a income, to find housing, to access education is compromised because of the criminal justice system we have created in this country. And if you care about criminal justice reform, you have to put race at the center of that because the burden is so profound in communities of color and the pain is real and it's, continu it's continuing on and on and on. When I think about leaders and who is making a change, honestly, the, the conversation has shifted so much in recent years because of the leadership of formerly incarcerated people, people coming out of the system. I think about Andrea James and who ha was incarcerated in the federal criminal justice system and with her colleagues in prison created the National Council of Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and what a godsend she has been to educating advocates like me, educating practitioners and educating her sisters who are in prison and her sisters who have come out and she has really built an amazing, amazing campaign and movement to put women at the center and not make and make sure that their voices are heard and that the issues that they use uniquely experienced in the, in the criminal legal system are not ignored. I think there are a lot of folks like her, but I really think that that kind of leadership and, f and voice helping us as a community of advocates focus where the priorities should be and how we make our decisions around policy and what we want to advocate for is so critical. It's so absolutely critical. Do we need law enforcement champions when we're, when we're advocating for, for, for reform? And how important has the role of sworn law enforcement, of the judiciary, and of law enforcement generally, how important is their role in the advocacy work that each of you um, is doing? Sure, well, I mean, actually, there's actually been survey research of this and the public, who are the most trusted messengers on criminal justice reform? And number one is police. Uh, number two is actually formerly incarcerated people. And thank you for mentioning that. And Matthew Charles, who's the first person released under the First Step Act, is here. We're going to hear from him. But uh, he's made the most of every single day he's been out of federal prison. I can tell you that. He's been all around the country. But um, the good thing is a lot of sheriffs in particular, in most places these are elected individuals, um, and most of them were you know, cops before they were out on the street. So they want more resources out on the street. Uh, but what they find when they're elected sheriff is all the money's going into the jail, and especially for people with mental illness, $300 a night in county jail on average. Um, so we found many of them to be good partners um, in tackling these issues and really creating alternatives uh, to bring people to jail to begin with through police diversion programs like LEAD, uh, for example, in Seattle. Um, and so um, as much as we should focus on sentencing reform, and, and we strongly support that, I think that uh, creating alternatives if you look at Texas, the main thing we've done is shift resources to the front end of the system. Um, and we have actually cut the incarceration rate by 50% since 1980, 1998. We now have the same number of people in prison we did in 1998, 143,000, still a lot of people, but we have 29 million Texans versus 19 million men, so there's your 50% drop. Um, but I think that uh, a lot of times it's a lot easier from a strategic standpoint to like we did in this latest budget in Texas, fund pretrial diversion. We put in money for 4,000 more people to be diverted pretrial. Um, bail reform is huge. Keeping someone out of jail to begin with is even better. Um, all the data shows if someone stays in jail just a few days, a few nights before uh, their trial, uh, before being released, let alone for weeks or months before their trial, their chances of ultimately being sent to prison go up. Uh, their chances of getting a longer prison sentence go up. Uh, this is all from Arnold Foundation and other research. So. It, we know that to be true. And so the quicker we can um, either get people out of jail uh, through, uh, you know, not obviously keeping people in jail simply because they can't afford bail, or better yet, divert them through things like police uh, diversion to treatment and so forth, um, that will actually affect the back end numbers in terms of how many people end up incarcerated. One of the biggest problems I'll, we have, and I'll conclude with this, is people cling to time served because they've sat in jail and they can't afford bail. So that's an enormous problem. But getting police to come out and say, look, we need more more resources. I need a place for my officers to take someone who's mentally ill instead of the jail. That is a great thing, and that really does resonate both with policymakers and the public. So uh, 
I think it's really important to have police and prosecutors and judges um, at the forefront of criminal justice reform, but we are never going to get the type of transformational change if, if, if those are the ones leading the fight for reform. Um, and this is where, when I think about the most exciting parts of the movements, I think it's the one, are the ones that are being led by you know, ordinary people living in a city or living in a suburb or a rural county who are just fighting for change. And they're changing the situation on the ground that makes it possible to elect people like Larry Krasner or John Crusoe and Rachel Rollins. I wanna answer the racial justice question with a story, and I'll make it quick. So this is a convening put together by the Aleph Institute. I, I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm Israeli, I'm Jewish. Um, my Jewish faith is part of why I'm in this work. Um, I wanna share a story of being in Germany um, um, in November. I think there's a couple of people in the room today who were part of that trip. But we visited a concentration camp as the first stop on that trip. And it was a concentration camp in Hamburg, uh, Germany, that was liberated in 1945 after tens of thousands of people were murdered there, mostly Jews. Um, after, I think in around 1950 or 1949, the German government conver converted the concentration camp to a prison. Because it makes sense in some ways, right? The barracks were already there, the facility had been built, they converted this concentration camp to a prison. It wasn't until the 1990s, I believe, that the survivors of the concentration camp and their relatives petitioned the German government and said, how dare you turn this into a, con uh, a prison? This needs to be a memorial site for the people who were killed at this concentration camp. The prison was eventually shut down and now it's a memorial site to the concentration camp. We have prisons in the United States that were built on slave plantations. We have prisons like Angola in Louisiana that were built on the same site where thousands of, of black people were murdered in the name of the United States. We need to turn those sites into memorials to people who were killed during slavery. And until we do that, until we recognize the connection between slavery and mass incarceration that is so real in places where literally you have a prison built on a, on a former slave plantation, we're never gonna be able to have racial justice be at the center of the conversation, which is what it has to be in the same way the, that in Germany, when you talk to prison officials there and ask them, why is it that you have a rehabilitation-focused system, they say it's because we learned the lessons from the Holocaust and we learned the importance of treating every person with dignity and respect. And that's a type of transformational change we need here in the United States. The panel has concluded. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I mean, what do you say to that? Um, I, I, extraordinary. Um, Kara, I mean, reflecting on, on some of the comments both from Udi and from Mark, um, when we're getting to transformational change, slouching our way towards, towards that transformational change, um, are there other allies, both in law enforcement and elsewhere, that we are under-enrolling in this? And what allies would you like to see, part of the coalitions that are really pushing for reform and criminal justice, that really haven't been as strong or maybe as able to participate um, in leading changes you'd like to see? Who are the folks that you want in your, on your team uh, when you're advocating in legislation at the federal level? Sure. Um, well, I have worked with the faith community quite a bit. Um, I used to work for the United Methodist Church and convened a coalition of faith leaders and faith organizations. And what is clear is there's compassion and a sort of innate understanding among a lot of the folks who represent various religious institutions, denominations, that what we are doing in this country and the level of incarceration um, in this country is a moral failure and must be corrected. And it's fitting to be here, right, with um, at this conference with Aleph, um, talking about we need more involvement in the faith community because they're, it's there, but they don't have the resources that they need. Generally speaking, faith organizations don't have the resources that they need to really lead in the way that I know that they can. What is so important about the faith community is you have people of faith everywhere. They are in every community, they are in every 
district, jurisdiction, every member of Congress has congregations throughout. And you have leaders of those congregations who are willing to step up, to speak to lawmakers, to advocate for the moral arguments around mass incarceration. But they don't have the resources to implement that. And they need guidance and training on advocacy. I mean, I, I remember very clearly calling uh, a pastor in Mississippi and saying to him, you know, we really need to invest, uh, influence Senator Wicker on this bill in Congress. Do you think you could organize uh, an in-district meeting? He said, well, I'm not a Republican. Why would he meet with me? I'm like, you're a constituent. He must meet with you. That you your voice matters. You, your opinion is relevant. And I think we need, as an advocacy community, to do a much better job in educating people about what it means to be a citizen and what it means to be an advocate. We all have a voice, and all of our voices matter. We should not shy away from using it. Um, to get back to the law enforcement, you know, a, a lot of my experience uh, around advocacy has been at the federal level. And the value of law enforcement, can, it, their influence is undeniable. You know, they can, with the wave of a hand, sink a bill or advance a bill. And as someone who spends a lot of my time on sentencing reform, that can be extremely frustrating. Because generally speaking, many of the most powerful law enforcement organizations are working in opposition to us. and. It is by the, many times, the grace of God that we are over, we are able because, to overcome them because we have built a diverse and large enough constituency advocating on the other end of why sentences are too long and why we have to curb the excesses of our system. Um, we often have a few individual law enforcement leaders, the Interna International Association of Chiefs of Police, Police also often comes to down on the right side, uh, but many, many law enforcement organizations, particularly ones that have a lot of influence in Washington, are often working against us. And we just have to figure out how we work around them. Because as Udi said, if we're waiting for them to lead us, we're going to be waiting a very long time. And we're not going to, we're definitely going to be waiting 75 years, if not longer. So we have to, we have to just continue to do what we know is right and take along the people who know what is right. And that includes faith leaders. That includes youth. That includes educators and teachers who have students facing these issues in their classrooms. It includes people who work in the medical and mental health community, people who work um, in housing issues. I mean, these are fundamental people who understand hunger. I mean, one of our best partners is Bread for the World, a hunger organization. Their advocacy traditionally has only been about food stamps, not only, but it's on getting access to food stamps. Well, they understand that people who are leaving incarceration who are being denied food stamps are more likely to recidivate because they don't have access to food stamps. So this becomes, they understand that mass incarceration is also affecting the people that they've been working for. And so it's a, been a real pleasure over the years to realize that so many of our colleagues in, uh, in other, working in other issuaries really do understand that there's an intersection. And and that we need to invest in the social safety net if we want to prevent crime and if we want to reduce mass incarceration. Mark, um, building on his comments, when and you and you do work all all around the country in states. And let's be honest: in some of the places where we work, all across the country, uh, the politics are not what we would consider uh, progressive. I'm using air, uh, verbal air quotes. Um, you know, in Oklahoma. If we talked about the stuff that some of the stuff we're talking about now, you know, I don't know that we would we would have the same, uh, you know, reception in this room, right? It's a different ethos and different folks uh, that different folks have when they approach this issue. So, Mark, who do you see as the really critical allies? And then I want to get back to this idea around prosecutors. How can reform-minded prosecutors, regardless of party, um, how can they be, you know, powerful advocates, and how can law enforcement be powerful advocates for progress here? Well, Oklahoma is a great example because in 2016, uh, they passed a ballot measure that reduced uh, drug possession from a felony to a high-level misdemeanor. And it got about 65% of the vote. Um, obviously, the ACLU, many others, played a critical role. But one of the groups that also played a major role was the business community in Oklahoma. Um, some of the leaders of the 
largest companies there, energy companies and others, banks, uh, they've come together, Oklahomans for Criminal Justice Reform, which we're involved in. We have two staff members full-time in Oklahoma. Uh, right on Crime now has uh, full-time directors covering eight states. Because we really, some of the most effective models in the criminal justice reform movement have been things like justice reinvestment, where they'll go in for one year in a state. But sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes there's not even the political will, uh, which has also been true in Florida, right, for the governor and the speaker and lieutenant governor, they all have to sign something saying they want these national groups to come in and provide the data analysis, and it's all excellent. But if you don't have the political will to get the process going, and then the second thing is sometimes it takes more than a year, and sometimes there's backsliding after a year. So having a full-time presence on the ground, especially in some of the states that have proven the most challenging, was something we decided to take on. In Oklahoma, Louisiana were among those states. So uh, this session in Oklahoma, one of the things we championed was making uh, that uh, ballot measure retroactive. And thankfully, on the last uh, day of the session, that went through some other reforms did not, but we hope to accomplish those next time, including bail reform. But I think the, the business community is huge because they have an interest in this. First of all, not having their tax dollars that could go to, you know, workforce training or transportation or education going only to prisons. And then secondly, for, uh, we all know the labor market's very tight. Uh, business leaders are speaking up and saying, we need workers. And that includes people who are involved in the criminal justice system, getting them back to work. Um, we talked earlier about bail reform. If somebody's in jail, for uh, several days, they can lose their job and so forth. So um, uh, I think that that is a critical group. The faith community has also been very active in Oklahoma. So I think at the end of the day, and your polling kind of reveals this, um, there may be differences in language in how we talk. Uh, perhaps, you know, we all heard men from Mars and women from Venus or whatever, so maybe it's like that, but we all want to get to the same place of uh, fewer people in prison, more public safety, more people working and taking care of their families. So I think that resonates just as well in Oklahoma as in San Francisco. <laughs> I want to I want to pivot to talk about two quick things, and then I want to, if I have consensus from the will of the room, I want to leave lots of time for questions because I feel like this has been an excellent and energetic discussion. Um, two things, you know, num number one, um, advocacy is a really tricky thing in criminal justice reform and in reforming the criminal legal system, because once you author a reform and the governor signs it or a prosecutor implements it, then there's another campaign that happens. And that's around implementation, right? And many folks in this room in particular, judges and probation officers and prosecutors and, um, and others that work within the system then have the, the obligation and the burden of working with the reforms that are enacted by policymakers. My, my question for you is this. Um, what are the limits of the advocacy strategies that we have? And do we have to have as much energy around implementation? And what is that campaign if we're really going to see systemic change within the system? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to answer that again with a story. And one of my favorite I moments. Stories, Udi. <laughs> These are great. One of my favorite moments from the 2018 election was actually in involved Rachel Rollins. I don't know if she's still here, um, the Suffolk County District Attorney. And during that race, we held ACLU, along with the candidates for office there, the first ever debate for district attorney within a jail. So the debate for district attorney was held within the Suffolk County Jail, and the only people who were allowed to ask questions of the candidates were people who were currently incarcerated in that jail. Exactly. It was one, <laughs> I mean, I sat in the audience the whole time, I'm like, wow. <laughs> But the reason I think that is so brilliant, the reason we implemented that as a strategy and want to replicate it, including ideally for the presidential debates, what if they had a debate actually in a state prison or federal prison? How amazing would that be? Is because suddenly shifts the equation of who are you accountable to. Once a politician feels that he or she is accountable to people who are incarcerated or living with a criminal record, which we know is one in three adults in America, or one in two actually adults in America, or know someone, then their commitment is not only going to last one election cycle, but they realize in the same way they need to cater to the white Republican voter or to the you know, a union member, Democrat. Um, they have a constituency of engaged people that will hold them accountable the next time they're up for re-election, and that is the day that we will see change happen. Can that right, or do you want to gently push back on Udi's um, characterization? And so it's a it's a continuum of kind of community-based political power that's going to keep folks accountable. But is that really enough to close the gap between what advocacy produces in terms of legislation and real impact? 
Well, as far as specific legislation that might be turned into law, I mean, implementation, in my view, is that's when the hard work starts. You know, getting laws passed, as I said, most a lot of my work has been at the federal level, it takes a long time and it's very hard work, but the implementation is even harder because it, I think a lot of times advocates think the, the job is done and it's not. You know, we, with the First Step Act, I mean, that's a prime example, right? Working with a Department of Justice that isn't necessarily, w or wasn't necessarily keen on accepting sentencing reform or prison reform. Um, that has been a very slow slog to get, uh, to get the, the provisions implemented. I think they're doing better now and starting to show results. But I know when I talk to um, staff on Capitol Hill, on both sides of the aisle, there's immense frustration with the Department of Justice that they are stonewalling, that they're trying to create obstacles when no, it's not necessary and um, are not putting the good faith effort that they would expect um, from the department given that a law has passed. So it's required advocates to be continually knocking on doors and banging and asking questions, uh, and banging on doors and asking questions and making sure that members of Congress are conducting appropriate oversight over the Department of Justice. Um, it's been real slow. Uh, you know, one of the provisions of the First Step Act, which I know a lot of folks cared about, which was the uh, good time provision, which expanded good time about a week uh, a week uh, per person on top of the good time, the existing good time. Um, it's, you know, there was a delay and it's not gonna go, hopefully it's supposed to go into effect in the, uh, July 19th, but you know, there's no guarantee because, you know, <laughs> it, there's there's lots of question marks about whether there's a genuine commitment to get this law done right. And what's so critical about it is not just that law, right? It's not just about the First Step Act. It's about every piece of legislation we ever that ever gets enacted. If we fail here, then we will fail again. And if we don't show that there has been progress made, that we show Congress that what they did was worth doing and show, demonstrate results, then there's going the incentive to move forward and to be more aggressive and more pr proactive in passing reform will be that much more difficult. So implementation is so, and appropriate implementation is so, so very important. Well, one of the keys is uh, including an evaluation component, and some states have done this in their justice reinvestment legislation, so you can actually measure whether it's being properly implemented. Um, and some data bills are really good, like Florida passed. Uh, there's Justice and others have worked on with us. The other thing I'll say is sometimes just pressing for legislation, even if it doesn't pass, leads to changes. So about five years ago, we and others started pushing for legislation in Texas on solitary confinement, and we never were able to pass any of it, but the agency got the message, and we've actually now half the number of people in solitary. This session, I was up there testifying on a bill that we had filed to say, before you revoke someone from probation to prison for technical violations, you have to try graduated sanctions first, and we couldn't get the votes. But the woman who heads the state uh, system for distributing probation funds said, you know what, this is a good idea. I'm going to require as a condition of the grants now to probation departments that they have to implement this. So sometimes you don't even need a bill, but just the discussion around a bill puts that pressure on the system. Mm. Before we get to questions, um, quick lightning round. We have talked about a lot of ideas. This is a panel of advocates, so of course we're going to be talking about a lot of ideas and all the things that are morally and politically urgent that we have to do immediately, right now. Um, we're going to close the prisons and turn them into memorials. We're going to reform bail, habitual offenders, restorative justice. We're going to make it Germany, open prisons, armed robbery, diversion, police-driven diversion, treatment alternatives, evaluation, graduated sanctions. It's a dizzying array and agenda that, that we've set forward on this panel. What should we be doing less of, or what's a little less urgent right now? Where should we be focusing? What's the highest impact thing we should be doing now? Are all of these equally important? Thoughts? So in terms of what to focus on, it's exactly the reason that the ACLU just came out with a 50 state blueprints. It's, it's not a plug, but it's genuine. Um, every state is different. And what we've been doing is actually looking at every state of who, who is being incarcerated in that state. So for example, in New York State, you know, drug incarceration, is not that prominent anymore, and we, which is a good thing, and we now need to focus on offenses involving violence. In places like Oklahoma or Louisiana, 
you know, drug-related offenses are still a major driver of incarceration in those states, and in those states, it's okay to focus so we on drug offenses. So we need to take that state-specific approach, which is what you'll find if you go on 50stateblueprints.org. Um, in terms of what we shouldn't be focusing on, and I know both of us will say this, um, um, the conversation around private prisons is a distraction. Um, and it should be a conversation around uh, prison profiteering which is a distinction, but an important one. A lot of profit is being made out of prisons. A lot of that profit is being made by the government, and this is why we love you know, our conservative allies, because talk about big government and you know, throwing money at government, that is the prison industrial complex. Um, and then there are a lot of businesses that make you know, money off of like food or whatever. Um, so so uh, you know, only about, what, 8% of the nationwide prison population is housed in, in, in private prisons. Some states that's higher, like Arizona, but I think that's a distraction. All right, this is a lightning round. Okay. Just give a plug, actually, which is not something I typically do. Uh, to the Trump administration has just rescinded um, contracting for, uh, uh, not contracting, sorry, the building, they were planning to build a federal prison in Kentucky and have decided to pull the funding for that after advocates in the community on both sides, but advocates uh, fighting against the building of that prison. The prison, federal prison population has declined significantly in recent years. Um, in the neighborhood of 30,000, maybe 40,000 people, and there really was, little justification for building that institution other than the it was the district of the head of the former head of the House Appropriations Committee. But, you know, um, that's neither here nor there. So anyway, good credit, credit for taking, because there was a lot of pressure because it, building prisons, even public ones, are seen as pro opportunities for communities to make jobs, um, particularly in rural areas. And part of the problem with the federal system is they're typically citing prisons in rural areas where there aren't people who are qualified to work in those prisons. So it's a, definitely a very good thing um, that that prison is not being built. We need to spend more time closing prisons, and that hasn't happened enough in this country, because until we start closing facilities, we're not going to really realize uh, the cost savings from uh, the decline in incarceration. Well, I mean, I, I think the uh, one of the things that's key is in every state, study who's going into prison, so you know like which sentencing laws are tr contributing the most to incarceration because it's not the same in every state. And you know, you'll be surprised to find if you look, for example, at local jails. In some places, the number one reason people go to local jail is driving with a suspended license, and number two or three may be failure to pay fines or fees, which we're going to hear about uh, in another panel. Um, so I think you have to customize it as. Uh, Udi was alluding to, to the specific jurisdiction, um, so that you don't spend, you know, more time on one thing which is not actually causing uh, the greatest number of admissions or uh, total number of people in prison. And by the way, you know, admissions are important because, you know, just, again, the small amount of time in prison, so yes, we want to focus on, as you said, the people uh, that shouldn't be in prison for life, but we also want to greatly reduce the churn factor of the criminal justice system. We have time for just a few questions. Apologize for breaking that pledge, um, but we had such rich conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I just kind of wanted to, to point out a strategy that I use in talking about criminal justice reform in my more rural community. You know, for people that read the New York Times talking about mass incarceration really you know, resonates with them. For people that are reading the local paper though, you know, I talk about building a system where people in our community can be healthy, have access to drug treatment and health care, and where everybody can thrive, and trying to put it in positives, I find uh, really resonates with people in, in my community. Right, and I, as advocates in this space of criminal justice reform, I think it's really important that we talk about things like health care and mental health care and affordable housing, because that's what helps to prevent crime as well. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, first, uh, thank thank all of you for doing what you do. It's it's really fantastic, uh, and um, but I have a fundamental question: of how are you going to get people to care enough about the criminals and the criminal justice system to get something accomplished? Because if you don't get the public to care, and you don't get the prosecutors to care and you don't get the judges to care, 
uh, and you don't get the politicians to care, then nothing will ever happen. And um, I, I just don't think people really understand who is going to jail, who is getting locked up, why they're getting locked up, and why maybe they shouldn't be there. So my question is, you're doing all of these wonderful things, but if nobody cares, and I will tell you, as someone who's been locked up, you get the feeling that nobody cares. So that, that is the fundamental problem I think that uh, you all have. I, you know, I would point to Matthew Charles, who was sitting right there, but appears to have left. Uh, I can't imagine anyone hearing his story and hearing him speak and not caring. I think, you know, the, the prisons are filled with people who have very real stories and have family members. And, you know, the, there's a reason why people trust it, on this topic people who've been in the system, right? Because they're, they've experienced, there's a, and knowing those stories it, it, it creates empathy. I, I think the public has to be exposed and be approximate to people who've experienced the criminal justice system and know the, the harm firsthand. If they can un get exposure and understand them, I think that creates empathy and people are, will be motivated for change. I think the polling, shows, the polling shows that people care. It really does. We did 11 polls last year, including in places like Texas, Louisiana, including nationwide polls. 78% of likely voters support candidates for criminal justice reform. 59% of voters want candidates who commit to reducing the jail and prison population. That included 72% of voters under 44. So I think there's real, there's a generational change happening. I think the younger the voter, the more they do care about this issue. And I guarantee this is a top issue. It's a message we're giving presidential candidate. The younger the voter, the more they do care and vote on criminal justice reform. Oh, yep. We're gonna have to leave it there. Can you please join me in thanking this wonderful panel? Thank you.